Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event hosted by us at Ben Bird, um, uh, Macquarie University, and the Australian Society for Computers and the Law. Um, this is the, the event is artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and law enforcement in search of a good government framework. Just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which our Sydney office stands and from which we are joining you, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present and emerging, as the custodians of continuing culture, knowledge and law. I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement and warm welcome to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us here in the room and online. I would also like to extend my acknowledgement to all traditional custodians of the lands and water from which online participants are joining us across Australia. So it's great to see people in person um, after a bit of an absence and I also extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Um, so this afternoon we'll hear from each of our key speakers and then we will be followed by a short break. Um, before we reconvene for our panel discussion. Uh, people online will be able to submit questions via the chat function uh, during the break uh, if they have a question that they would like to get put to the panel. Uh, after the panel, those in the room were invited back for some food and drinks uh, and a chance to talk to some people in person. Shortly, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Richard Bachelot and um, who was going to introduce the subject in more detail and introduce our panel of, of speakers. So Rita is a senior lecturer at Macquarie University, Macquarie University Law School and an international expert in intellectual property and information technology law. Her recent focus has been on legal regulation and governments of artificial intelligence technologies. She has researched and elected in universities in Japan, Germany, Lithuania and Australia. Rita is currently a lead investigator at the project on government use of face recognition technologies, legal challenges and solutions funded by the Lithuanian Research Council. Um, just before I hand over to Rita, um, I'd like to introduce you to Marina, who's the president of the Australian Society for Computers and Law and who's current Hosting the event, um, just to say a few words. Thanks, Thanks Marina. Hello. Hi, everyone. Isn't it lovely to be meeting in person? And we have so many more online, so it's an absolute delight. Thank you so much, Curator, and to Kate and all the Bird Bird as well. Um, so, the, the Oxford Asian Society for Computers and Law is a multidisciplinary, intergenerational think tank um, with a vision to co design a future for us all to live in at the intersection of law, technology and society. So it's quite a big task. And I have to say, it's so wonderful to have so many volunteers come on board and say, yes, we want to be part of this, this essentially this movement. We are aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and access to justice plays a critical part of those UN Sustainable Development Goals, particularly number 16. So this forms part of that track, if you like. Our membership includes members from industry, government, academia, civil society, as well as students and others wanting to engage with this thoughtful, impactful work. Absolutely thrilled to be supporting this event with the two other co-hosts, Bird and Bird and the Macquarie University. And I think now, Rita, it's over to you. So I'd like to welcome now everyone on, on behalf of Macquarie Law School, which was the third, which is the third organization that is all co-hosting this event. So we are really pleased to see so much interest from, from, from different stakeholders, both coming here face to face and online in, uh, into this very important topic on you know, how we want to regulate and govern face recognition technology and their use in, in policing. So before um, I start the session, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous people on whose land this event and all my work in life takes place and, um, and pay respect to their elders um, past and future. So the purpose uh, of this event to really explore face recognition technology use in law enforcement. So what challenges we and what risks are these uh, technologies pose as well as what opportunities they give and how we are going to um, um, balance those opportunities and risks um, and the, what sort of governance frameworks we could, uh, we do need in order to um, establish that balance. So in the first session, we'll hear three presentations um, by, I think, overall five key speakers. 
um, who will talk about um, risks uh, and the governance approaches adopted so far with relation to face recognition law enforcement in three different jurisdictions or regions, that is Australia, New Zealand and, um, and Europe. And then after the break, we'll um, move to panel discussion where, in addition to our speakers, we'll have a New South Wales Information, Information Commission, Ms. Teed, already can see her at the end of the class joining us, as well as um, um, Angus Murray from Queensland's um, Organization of Liberties joining us online. Um, so you might notice that we have been, uh, that I've been mentioning kind of history recognition technology and governance frameworks, but not so much regulation. And that's on purpose because while we completely understand the importance and relevance of regulating these technologies uh, at let's say federal or state level, we decided to, to, to focus on governance aspect this, in, this, uh, in this event because we believe through appropriate governments, sometimes we can uh, achieve as good results as through legislation if we do that right. And also, it's sometimes easier, you know, to, to develop those frameworks as and legislation takes for such a long time, and we need to act urgently on this topic. Okay, so without further ado, now please um, allow me to introduce our first uh, speakers. Um, so the first presentation will be delivered by Nick Evans and Hannah uh, Harris. So Dr. Nick Evans is our senior uh, is a senior research innovation associate at the Australian New Zealand Policing Advisory Agency, ANSPA and the lecturer in policing and emergency management at the University of Tasmania. He's also a researcher with the Tasmanian Institute of Law Enforcement Studies. Um, Nick's research focuses on broadly on policing ethics, the ethics of armed force, institutional trust, and legitimacy and policing, policing methodologies. Nick's research goals, I suppose keeping in mind his one fit in research and one fit in police, <laughs> is to harmonize academic work and strategic, strategic priorities in policing which he pursues through strong ties with Australian police jurisdictions and police adjacent organizations. And our next speaker is Dr. Hannah Harris, uh, who's my dear colleague at Macquarie Law School, and she's also a co-organizer of this event and also will chair the second session. So her research area is transnational law and corporate, gen uh, corporate regulation generally, and she, she works on various topics, among which is um, the interaction between law and technology, uh, uh, and challenges and opportunities presented by artificial intelligence for policing law enforcement and regulatory compliance. So Dr. Harris' research is um, concerned with the development of optimal regulatory uh, incentives and sanctions, as well as optimal inter internal governance practices within key organizations um, that shape the way the law is practiced and experienced uh, by stakeholders and regulatory targets. So Hannah and Nick, floor is yours. And um, um, yes. <laughs> Get the slide going. Uh, yeah, we should have slide. Yep, you're up. It's just behind. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Good everyone. Um, we've had some uh, acknowledgments of the indigenous owners of the land, but also would like to pay my respects and acknowledge the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Given that we've got New Zealand audience online, I'm also from New Zealand, as is Dr. Hannah Harris here. So um, we are slowly but surely taking over. So um, thanks for the introduction, Rita. Um, as I said, uh, as Rita mentioned, I work for the Australian New Zealand Policing Advisory uh, Agency, as well as the University of Tasmania. So I sort of sit in the policy and research fields. So hopefully the perspective that I can then bring today is one from the policing side, but also tempered with the more research and academic side of things. So first slide or next slide, thank you. Here we go. Magic, it is magic. Look at that, that's um, effect recognition or voice uh, emulation, there we go. So on to that, what I want to speak to you about first is some opportunities that we see as both current and emerging in policing. Um, and then I will talk a little bit to some of the risks that are also seen in that field. Um, and then we'll hand over to Hannah who will capably speak through some of the ways you can mitigate those risks as well as some strategies for that. So very quickly then, in terms of opportunities, the ones that we see as currently in use in policing, and that's what I mean by opportunities, so current use cases, I want to walk through a few of them to help ground the discussion as to where some of those risks might lie, and also to get an understanding of what police are doing across Australia and New Zealand with it. Um, and I know uh, there are colleagues online who will speak to in far more detail than I will on this. This is just a brief preface. So firstly, natural language processing. That is as simple as automating transcription services. 
But that is something that is fundamentally important for the policing perspective if you're doing an investigation, for instance, and there are thousands and thousands and hours of transcripts of uh, interviews that you have to go through, or indeed um, transcriptions from videos, for instance. And that is a really important intelligence gathering tool, as well as one that can produce evidence for investigations. Slightly not as sexy as some of the other uses, but it's one that is emerging as very important to police, I believe, in New South Wales, um, for instance. Secondly, is recognition and detection technology. And we'll have a lot of discussion today about the recognition side of that um, from, from the sort of facial recognition perspective, so I'm not going to go on too much about that. But the detection side is also important. And detection of things like acoustic detection, for instance, in the United States, Certain police jurisdictions have started to have gunshot detection software that can detect whereabouts in a city a gunshot might have been fired or uh, at which time precisely where and try and triangulate police response for that. Um, and then of course, facial recognition technology uh, comes about very much uh, through several different applications. Um, your obvious ones, uh, scanning databases to match two photos together or indeed uh, from the surveillance side of things, integrating facial recognition technology, for instance, into CCTV. Um, those are some applications um, that have proved to be controversial with the Clearview case that I'm sure we'll get some recognition later on in this chat. Um, but those two are ones that have started to see emerging use cases in um, Australia and, and New Zealand. And then finally, predictive analytics or predictive statistics. And those are uh, applications of technology based on learn, uh, machine learning or, or deep learning even um, that are fed a database of information and then based on that tend to create, in policing at least, risk profiles for certain individuals or indeed groups of people. Now an example of this that has come around recently in Queensland is recidivist domestic violence offenders or those at the highest risk of recidivism. Um, intervention strategies can then be developed around that, um, such as uh, focused deterrence trials where someone comes through the door, knocks on the door, we've identified you as part of the program. Um, two more controversial uses, um, like the Compass case in the United States, which we talked about as well, um, which looked at the likelihood of um, recidivism occurring from those who've been failed. All right. And then in terms of emerging tech, um, those are the technology types that have uh, some use case down the line, that is five to 10 years from now, that are being trialled out in the trial phase at the moment um, by policing, or at least where policing use cases have been identified. An obvious one is automated vehicle technology. Um, we know that that's being tested for commercial use now, but there's also use for policing um, if you can automate, for instance, patrols. Secondly, General adversarial networks have started to be seen as a digital forensics tool. Um, for instance, being able to do, uh, I guess, digitize the process of sketch artistry, where you can then create faces that more accurately reflect what someone is trying to describe. Um, again, slightly more mundane use uh, relative to some of those other technologies in there, but nevertheless an important one for policing. Um, and as part of that, of course, you have the flip side, which is all of these technologies have perhaps um, use cases in the criminal side of things. And police obviously have to keep abreast of that sort of development as well. For example, uh, GAN technology can be used um, to generate faces that then can't be picked up um, by facial recognition because they don't exist. And therefore, you can use that as a counter if you want to act anonymously online or, or you know, create fake IDs, what have you. And then finally, um, swarm technology. Swarm technology mostly refers to the use of it in drones. Drones are, of course, something that police have started to use, are using, and see applications in search and rescues, as well as um, tracking people down, um, and have fairly like high-level operational use at the moment. But in terms of swarm technology, that's, of course, being able to link via mesh networks or other technologies that link them together, so they're all operating in concert. Um, that can be useful for surveillance purposes, but also for covering large areas of territory for search and rescue purposes, which is of course a function that police can have, and then more responsive capabilities. But none of this would be complete without talking about some risks. Second slide, please. Perfect. All right, so brief taxonomy of the risks I'm going to very quickly cut her off. The ethical and legal risks, workforce risks, and your authorizing environment risks for policing. So, ethical and legal. 
an obvious one, bias, which is uncontrolled and unconscious bias is what we mean by that, because the application of certain uh, areas of policing sometimes has to take in bias. If you're looking for a specific type of offender, for instance, white collar criminals, for instance, you have certain profiles you're looking for. But what we mean is unconscious bias and uncontrolled, that is developed out of the data or information that you have fed into your system that you didn't anticipate having certain biases. And then we'll, of course, replicate and amplify those that do exist. Compass case, great example of that. Secondly, we talk a lot about transparency and privacy. Now, the transparency risk for policing is one that you might not anticipate as being what I'm going to talk about. But normally when we talk about transparency in um, these sorts of areas in policing and law enforcement, it means the public being able to understand what it is that police are doing. Now, of course, we know in order for police to be operationally efficient, they need to have a certain degree of uh, clandestine operation or of covert operation. But importantly for policing, often officers themselves might not have full, under, full understanding or full awareness of the operation of some of these technologies. And that's what we mean by transparency, the transparency of the algorithms themselves so that the practitioners who are using them understand it. And that's important because when inevitably an inquiry takes place or someone is brought up to explain why someone was arrested or why something went wrong and you're not able to get up and explain why it was that you acted in a certain way based on the decisions of the um, algorithm, then you have a problem. And that's what we mean by transparency. That's where you get a risk of policing in that. On top of that, you have privacy risks. And obviously, in today's session, we'll talk a lot about that. But three briefly, two elements that come up in the policing risks. Uh, first, privacy concerns um, around how something is collected or around the um, packaging of information that might not be particularly transparent as to where it's come from and, as well, and to whether the proper protocol or legislative frameworks have been followed. Um, and that's where we get the clear view case coming. The second concern with privacy from the policing perspective or concerns about policing using it and a risk is, of course, the surveillance concern and concerns that people have about the risk that this indicates a, a move towards a surveillance state or a move towards uh, undue surveillance. We then have workforce. The uh, risk here is that currently Australia wide, roughly about estimate, very rough estimate back of the uh, envelopes with math. About 100 PhDs may be being undertaken per year in AI technology. 50% of that probably leave the country afterwards. So you have a narrow band of people with expertise capable of understanding these technologies. So then police are forced with, do you hire these people in? It's very, very competitive, very, very um, expensive to do. Or do you train in-house? Or do you try and identify capabilities that already exist that you can then form a team around? So for instance, signals tech technicians, statisticians already in policing, and experts in neural networks, that sort of thing. Again, very expensive to do. You have to then decide for policing, do you have private partnerships that do it, or do you do it in-house? And finally, authorising environment. Authorising environment is essentially what gives police the legitimacy and the trust, the public legitimacy in their eyes and eyes of government and their trust. And what's, what's often discussed or is at least found is that usually if the public have a general level of trust in the police, they tend to trust in certain uh, methodologies or ways in which police go about it. Now, that's not a universal rule, of course, but at least as a general rule, that tends to be true. The public concerns around AI, certain studies have found at least, tend to revolve around their application of things like HR um, processes. You know, will I get rejected by a machine or will a machine take my job? Um, when it comes to the police um, side of the authorising environment, though, if police lose trust in of the public in general through something like, uh, I don't know, um, CHO directives being uh, implemented in a particularly strong way, then the risk for them is that, of course, they then lose the legitimacy and trust to apply certain technologies, regardless of whether the trust is lost in their use of that technology. And so that's a risk then in general for policing, which is if you want to use these technologies that are to some degree controversial and, and risk heavy, uh, you need to make sure that you have a high existing degree of trust already. So with that, some of those risks can be resolved that, and Hannah will talk to you about some ways we can mitigate them or resolve them. Hannah, over to you. I think might have um, 
oversold my ability to solve this <laughs> for you. But um, so, um, so I'd like to add to Nick's very insightful uh, overview in this space and particularly look at the development of good governance frameworks for the application of AI to policing and law enforcement. Um, Nick's already mentioned some of the use cases that we're seeing in Australia for AI and law enforcement. And before I get into the details of kind of uh, how we might create a governance framework, I'd like to explore a little bit more some of the potential uh, benefits that are maybe more futuristic or innovative, as well as the risks that emerge from that. And from that place, then, I'd like to share the kind of ideas I have around good governance, which stem from my research on comparative analysis of law and practice in some of the other jurisdictions that Rita has already mentioned, uh, particularly the US and the UK in my own work, um, and experiences with governance frameworks in the public and private sectors. So this idea of good governance and the idea of governance generally is not new and it's not specific to policing or to AI. And I think there's some useful opportunities to draw from experience around governance frameworks in other areas that might apply quite well to the challenges that we're facing in the AI and law enforcement space. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a little bit of a discussion of some of the potential innovations or benefits that AI technology could have in law enforcement. And I think this is an important starting point for a governance framework because it explains why we want a governance framework rather than a mitigation strategy, right? There are certain benefits to the use of AI in a policing context, and we don't want to lose those through an overly uh, cautious approach to prevention or, or governance. Um, so two of the really interesting ones that I would like to discuss are object detection and computer vision. And the reason why I've picked this one uh, is because it ties into the facial recognition technology discussion that Rita will kick off next. Uh, but I also want to flag some of the, as um, Nick pointed out, less sexy uses of computer vision technology and kind of highlight that whilst there can be some quite extreme and controversial use cases for computer vision, there are also some less extreme use cases. Um, so, for example, one that is used commonly is automatic license. The same technologies and algorithms that might be deployed in facial recognition, live facial recognition, which has very high risk and controversy, are already being used in these simpler use cases. Um, and some of the benefits that these innovations have include increased investigative capacity, reduced burden on officers and analysts, um, and general efficiency advancements. Um, another very exciting area of AI use in policing is network analysis and anomaly detection, which is already being deployed to some degree, um, but has also the potential to be more widely applied to detect relationships and trends internally within police. So less looking at the outward facing side of interaction with the community and more looking at policing as a data set internally. Um, and finally, and perhaps most transformatively, there is the potential for AI to support built-in objectivity. Uh, and this is a very interesting one because as we know from experiences in Australia and elsewhere, ingrained bias is a really substantial risk in policing and law enforcement generally, independent of technology. And we also have examples where deployment of AI technology without consideration of pre-existing bias is amplified and ingrains this bias. So this is a challenge that really needs to be addressed, but there's also the potential for AI tools to help eliminate such bias by providing uh, mechanisms designed with appropriate parameters, data, and quality, and assurance oversight that might reduce the need to rely on traditional heuristics or subjective decision-making practices, which could also lead to ongoing bias. Recognizing that the bias we see when we apply AI technologies to pre-existing policing data is bias that has come to pass because of previous decision-making patterns. Um, so in this way, we start to see the importance of an overarching good governance framework that can ensure that the innovation and benefit brought by AI technologies are developed and deployed in both an efficient but also in an ethical manner. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just again, kind of uh, emphasizing some of the challenges, and I've already mentioned that Nick has covered some of these, but I think one that I really want to 
emphasise before talking about the application of a stakeholder governance framework is the importance of stakeholder trust. Um, engagement and legitimacy, these are fundamental challenges for policing overall and they are enhanced when you're dealing with new technologies because of the kind of information asymmetries and Nick mentioned some of the information asymmetries within policing um, relative to the technological evolution that's occurring in the private sector but then there are additional asymmetries between policing and the community or government and regulatory actors. Um, so this really conflates that challenge. And additionally, the commercialization and accountability challenge is a really unique barrier. And we've touched on this too, but this idea that we need to develop these technologies to be specifically applied to policing, to consider these risks of bias and the specific applications, but we don't necessarily have the in-house capacity to do that. And this leads to partnerships with the private sector, potentially with universities, researchers and other third parties. And this is why I think that the governance frameworks that exist for the private sector, as well as for other government organisations, can be de deployed really helpfully to, to overcome some of these risks and challenges. Um, so in the interest of time, I will skip forward. So next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so I will now outline the foundations of the good governance framework that I've been developing through my research and comparative work. And I believe that a really central pillar of this framework is a stakeholder centric approach. And this recommendation is drawn from existing police governance literature globally, but also the literature on ethical governance in more generally. It is increasingly accepted in corporate governance research and practice that a stakeholder approach provides the most robust and responsive as well as equitable outcomes in decision making, particularly around innovative issues or in a dynamic operating environment, which we see with the use of AI. Um, so some research by Absalon identifies the limitations of governance strategies that are reactive and defensive rather than proactive and focused on stakeholder engagement and collaboration. And when you explore this in use cases like uh, Clearview or Compass was mentioned, or, or the trial of facial recognition, live facial recognition technology in the UK, you see a lot of these um, crises occurring that had a proactive uh, government's response being adapted might not have occurred. Um, so I believe that this proactive approach is well suited to the AI and policing challenge. So what does a stakeholder approach to governance really look like? A good governance framework really needs to include measures to increase transparency and that's really key. What does transparency mean? I think Nick pointed out that transparency can be viewed in terms of internally within the police and their interaction with the technology but also externally how the police interact with the community and other stakeholders that they influence. Um, and recognizing the centrality of explainability, and this is an area that Rita works really heavy, heavily in, is explainability in AI and what it means to actually understand the technology that you're using. Um, risk assessment is really important too and should be undertaken before AI testing and deployment to avoid this retroactive need to take things back from use, which we're seeing often overseas. Uh, robot dogs, sounds like a great idea. They're really cute. Everyone in the community will love them. Turns out New Yorkers don't love robot dogs. They think they're going to bomb them. So, so robot dogs have to be rolled back and are no longer used by the New York police. Now you think about all of the cost involved, as well as the kind of misallocation of resources to create a product, essentially, that was negatively received and any potential benefit from that is now lost as well as the loss of public trust for future innovations and technology. So I think a really core element of a good governance approach is about early stage decision making, deciding when and why we're doing a certain thing and then also through the process reflecting back and that might be about stakeholder engagement. So not only internal re reflection but also how do we involve the community, government, regulators, uh, audit in this kind of idea of uh, assessment of the effectiveness of AI technologies. Um, so I think that this interaction between police and other stakeholders should become a really key component of risk assessment and increase awareness, understanding and alignment of the use of AI. And what I really like about this event is that we're seeing a kind of cross section of the relevant stakeholders here today. 
So community, civil society groups, government actors and regulators, police departments, policing organisations, as well as tech industry specialists and academia. We all have a role to play in this conversation. Um, so further research is necessary to really lock down exactly how a governance framework could play out. And there are unique challenges in policing compared to the private sector, and I recognise that in my work. But I think starting the conversation from this position of shared learning um, and building on what we already have and know is effective around stakeholder engagement, proactivity and transparency uh, is a really good starting point. Thank you very much, everybody. And I will now pass back to Rita to continue our conversation. Thanks so much, uh, Nick and Hannah. And I think that was a really great start of the conversation at, uh, that very provided a brilliant overview of opportunities and risks associated with the use of AI in general and also put a uh, face recognition technology, I think, in a, in a broader light to show where it sits there in a, in a broader context of AI in, uh, technologies in law enforcement. Now I'd like to um, invite our um, other two presenters that will also share one presentation and they will be uh, joining us online from New Zealand. I, um, I hope that now we can see them on the screen, on screen very soon. So we will have Dr. Nessa Lynch and Inspector Carla Gilmore joining us um uh, online so while they appear online i'll just start introducing them so uh, dr nessa lynch uh, currently divides her time between associate professor at the, at the faculty of uh, law at victoria university of wellington new zealand and academic director of the royal new zealand police college she uh, nessa and uh, her primary research interest is the criminal law and the criminal justice system as it applies to children and young persons and the secondary research area is in uh, biometrics and state surveillance, particularly DNA and face recognition technology. So Nessa extensively published on these topics and her expertise is sought after in the government, judicial and non-government fields. And among other important engagements, Nessa was a special advisor to New Zealand police on facial, facial recognition technology mm -hmm. and a member uh, as an interim chair of the Data Ethics Advisory Group. I also know that uh, Nessa has published an important report on face recognition technologies uh, in New Zealand. I'm sure she'll tell more about that. And the second speaker who um, will share this presentation with Nessa is Inspector Carla Gilmore, also from New Zealand, and she's the manager of emerging technologies at New Zealand Police and is currently leading New Zealand Police commitment to use new technologies safely and responsibly with a particular focus on security, privacy, legal and ethical implications. To serving police for 29 years, Carla um, has worked in a variety of roles, including rural and urban, urban policing, criminal intelligence, and others. And until uh, COVID-19, Carla was an Epic 21 security project people lead. Um, well, I, will, I would then, um, I really sincerely welcome uh, uh, both Nessa and Inspector here. We, it's great honor and pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today um, virtually. Um, and I will ha then I hand it over to you. And I would like just to highlight how, uh, how, how proud we are to have a second presentation um, shared by both an academic and a police representative. That's, that's I think, that engagement that we are really looking um, into, um, should, should be looking into more. Nessa, uh, I, 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 I floor is yours. Kia ora kato, everyone. Um, pleased to be invited and been able to present to you. Uh, so I'm Carla Gilmore, an inspector in the New Zealand Police. So I'm just going to kick off um, the presentation for uh, Dr. Nessa Lynch and I uh, and start by just giving a, an overview of our journey, the New Zealand Police journey, to strengthen our commitment to use technology safely and responsibly. So in 2020, uh, we hit the headlines uh, for our trial use of Clearview. Um, this was a short trial, uh, less than a month, actually, um, within a very small confined group. And uh, the outcome was to not use the technology. The investigation reason to use Clearview was with the best intentions and it was legal. However, it sparked concerns about the process we followed prior to that engagement. And it's exposed us to questions around how well we were making informed decisions 
uh, particularly from a privacy and ethical perspective. So that launched us into essentially going down the path around, so how do we make informed decisions on how we use technology safely and responsibly? We needed that we, we recognised that we needed to strengthen our approach and we undertook a, a number of pieces of work, um, primarily which I led within my role. Now this included developing a policy and a framework for the trial and adoption of new technology because as we saw it isn't just um, using or bring something into use uh, into our policing organization but you know there's also we need to consider against anything that we were potentially going to be trialing uh, because within that environment we we're obviously with the Clearview experience aware of the impact or perceived harm or unattended consequences that that would cause if we didn't make the, the right uh, queries into why we were using it and how it was going to be used. So we looked to see what was being done overseas um, and in the wider New Zealand government. I can just go back um, the slide and just stay on that one, thanks. Um, we developed a turnkey solution to the challenges that New Zealand police faces. Um, we've got a consideration of Te Tiri or Waitangi. Uh, we signed up to the algorithm charter um, of Aotearoa New Zealand. We commissioned an independent consultancy firm to do a stock take of our algorithms and our use of algorithms. It was really important for us to gain that um, specific advice and to ensure that we were complying with the charter that we had signed up to. Uh, we set up a, an independent expert panel. Uh, again, it's, you know, we recognise it's important that uh, we weren't siloed within the police organisation on um, how we made our decisions, that there's value in obviously that consul consultation and seeking um, outside expert independent advice to help inform form us. And of course, going through this time, there was in particular, our use of facial recognition technology was being questioned. Uh, and there were inaccurate accounts in the media of what we're doing, um, as you can see from a couple of those headings on that slide. Um, there was commentary um, that was really not what we were doing. Um, and this opened us up to actually how transparent were we being, or actually were we not being, about what technology we were using and how we were using it. And there was a lot of commentary that was happening overseas um, within law enforcement, um, which we could learn from. So embedded facial recognition capabilities are becoming more, across, more common across a wide range of technologies. So it's important that we do understand the parameters and the potential consequences of the use of this kind of technology. So to help us um, learn and inform us, we sought expert advice um, from uh, New Zealand's two leading experts and academic researchers in the field of facial recognition technology. And that was Dr. Nessa Lynch and Dr. Andrew Chen. And we asked them to, um, to give us a better understanding of our current use of facial recognition technology and the potential uses and what we needed to consider um, to do that in a safe and responsible way. So now I'll hand over to Dr. Nessa Lynch and the next slide, thanks. Thanks so much, Carla. Um, so kia ora katoa and uh, warm greetings to you all. Um, so Carla and I are really pleased to have this opportunity to address you. Um, so I'll just follow on from what uh, Carla was talking about and talk about the review. Um, so as you'll know from my bio, um, I'm in two worlds at the moment because I'm actually transitioning over from full time academia to um, a role within police. Um, so, uh, but I'm speaking in my capacity as an academic at the moment. Um, so as Carla said, um, uh, myself and Dr. Andrew Chen and a big um, regards and mihi to Andrew um, for his work. Um, he, he'll be here with us in spirit today. Um, so I had previous to this report that we did for police, um, I had carried out a large funded study um, on facial recognition in New Zealand, which covered not only policing, but a range of other spheres. Um, and that was with the New Zealand colleague, 
um, a colleague from the UK and a colleague from, from Australia, from Monash University. Um, so as a result of that, I think it was just before Christmas um, and 2020, and I had sent my report to a range of people, including the Commissioner of Police. Um, and actually the police got in touch with me pretty quickly um, and that led to the invitation to uh, carry out this review. Um, so uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, so um, as from my bio, I come from a background of youth justice and also DNA. Um, and Dr. Chen Andrew uh, is from a computer science background. So I think it was a really good range because we had that technical know-how um, and Andrew's deep knowledge of privacy and technology as well as my expertise. Uh, so I'm just going to give some very edited highlights of the report tonight. Um, but of course, the link is there and you're welcome to peruse it at, at your leisure. Um, so I'm presuming that we're quite a, I suppose, an educated audience on facial recognition technology. So I'm not going to go into detail on the technology. But one of our key findings was that um, there's a real spectrum of use of facial recognition technology. So when the public, as Carla have described, think about facial recognition technology, they usually jump straight to the idea that you're going to be tracked walking down the street. Um, but a key finding for us was that F4T is, a, is very much a range of technologies. So for instance, um, New Zealand police, like many large organisations, issue an iPhone to everybody. Um, so that is the use of facial recognition technology that you use the, the face recognition to unlock your iPhone. Um, so there is a real spectrum of use when we talk about facial recognition technology, and that's really important. Um, so we found that New Zealand Police was not a heavy user of facial recognition technology, so there was certainly no use of live automated like in other jurisdictions, but um, that there was some use and certainly there was a large potential for use. Um, so as we know, facial recognition can be used for a range of things, um, so security and access like unlocking your iPhone or building recognition systems. Um, uh, New Zealand Police were, were using some kind of quite basic identity matching um, through photos um, and there was some small use of retrospective analysis of footage, um, but certainly not compared to other jurisdictions. So a key finding for us in the risk matrix that we developed was that it was really important to look at that spectrum of use um, and that it would, if you thought about, say, a blanket ban, which has been um, mooted in some jurisdictions, you could be throwing the baby out with the bathwater and ruling out applications which are quite commonplace. Um, so, you know, it won't be a surprise to people here tonight, but obviously, as we mentioned at the start of this session, um, the regulatory and legal framework is far behind the technology. So um, we know that this seminar here is focused on governance, um, but obviously we found that um, there is a huge gap in uh, regulation um, and technology that the Search and Surveillance Act um, and other, there's no real uh, proper legislation that deals with other biometrics apart from DNA. So we're in a real regulatory gap, which is why governance is so important and um, while those uh, high level decisions are made about regulation. So another challenge that we found was, um, as you would be aware, the, the real range of situations in which law enforcement police collect an image. Um, so that can be every New Zealand police officer has an iPhone, um, you've got CCTV, you've got um, the police helicopter, you've got uh, provided images, you've got lineup images, you've got suspect images. So there's a huge range of images collected in a huge range of contexts. And again, because the law is quite uncertain in some areas, particularly how you collect images in the public sphere, um, that, that we saw this as a risk um, to be managed, that we made sure that with the advent of technology that these databases couldn't be merged because that would mean that there would be a, a lot more power. Um, we also saw, um, as relevant to tonight's discussion, we took a lot of lessons from other jurisdictions. So um, somebody already mentioned the case in, in England and Wales where live automated FRT is in more um, widespread use. So certainly we saw an opportunity for New Zealand police to learn from mistakes that had happened in other jurisdictions. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? 
Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't say next slide for that one. Um, uh, uh, once more, please. Um, so I'll go through um, just our high level of our key recommendations and then hand you back to Carla to tell you how, how they're being implemented. So our key recommendation, which I think is the high level one that was picked up by the media, uh, was to continue to pause any consideration of live automated facial recognition technology. And so our recommendation was that both in terms of accuracy, um, I suppose community expectations and the potential for discrimination and bias. Um, and we also found that there wasn't a real evidence base to support um, a, a business case for implementation. So um, that was a key recommendation. Um, so as I said, we found that facial images are collected in a wide variety of contexts. And um, so we recommended that there was a review um, and collation of the policy. So with a view to technology improving and those databases possibly be able to be merged. Um, so Carla and her team have already engaged on a reform program about commissioning and governance of emerging tech, so we endorse that. And um, so relevantly in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, we've got a, a, a treaty, Te uh, Turiti O Waitangi, um, and so that uh, requires partnership with Māori, the indigenous people um, of the land. And so this is particularly relevant in criminal justice where we do see over-representation of, of Māori. Um, we talked a lot as well about surveillance policy. So um, as you know, if you're involved in the law in this area, the law on surveillance in public um, is quite murky. And so we recommended that there was a clear policy on that. Um, we've seen a, a preponderance of third party CCTV networks, um, some of which could potentially contain um, FRT. So we wanted there to be guidance, not only for police systems, but also where police have access to uh, commercial networks or private networks. Um, so we wanted, everybody talks about training, um, I'm now in charge of implementing that at the police college, so um, we recommended that uh, there's a culture of ethical data use, including training when you get your device. Um, and lastly, that there was horizon scanning, so we recognised that perhaps facial recognition will um, get more accurate and maybe accuracy concerns would diminish, so it's important to keep reviewing the technology and based on how it's developed so that you're taking up the opportunities as well as the risks. OK, I'll hand back to you, Carla, to talk about implementation of the recommendations. Cool, Kira. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the key thing here was is that um, the report that was given really for us that we accepted all the 10 recommendations from the report and we've now set up a, a response plan to address those 10 recommendations. Uh, as Nessa said, we'd, uh, through developing the work that I've done with Emergent Tech and the new framework, um, had put us uh, in a good, a good place um, to leverage off that. The, the report has provided valuable insight and understanding of facial recognition technology. Um, and the considerations of the impact of use, uh, we're certainly a lot more informed um, on our current and potential uses uh, of facial recognition technology in the policing context, um, and applying those to uh, New Zealand. Uh, and certainly our awareness of accuracy and bias as key concerns, particularly on the population of Aotearoa New Zealand has been increased. We've still got a bit of work to do. Um, that further work continues to develop the robust governance policies and processes that are specific to our use um, and potential use of facial recognition technology. I think we need to make sure that um, while we're, you know, as Nessa has said, we're limited in our current use, but the technology is continually evolving and developing and will will gain accuracy. Um, which will make it more palatable, palatable for us to consider its use. Some connection problems. Nessa, would you like to jump in? Maybe if there is anything to finish off. Until I Carla. Yeah, I can I can wrap up. And um, so yeah, as as far as our, our, from our perspective as reviewers, um, you know, it was fantastic to have our ta our ten recommendations accepted and to see that the response plan um is in train already. And I think the last point that Carla was going to make was just about how 
um, some of the considerations and the framework that we implemented or recommended to be implemented in relation to facial recognition technology um, have applicability to other types of technology as well. So, um, you know, our, our colleague at the start who, uh, who listed all the various AI um, functions in a policing context, we think that the framework we developed has got quite a lot of applicability to other technologies as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, both Nessa and Carla, for uh, I think very interesting and uh, uh, helpful insights from New Zealand. And I think for Australia, it's especially interesting because I think Australia shares similar situation as, as far as implementation adoption of this of technology concern. As far as I know, it was also at least live test initial technology has been used to a limited extent. And I think it's a really good time now to start developing those frameworks before we use them and end up with some problems what happened let's say more in Europe and so thank you very much Nessa and Carla and we'll come back to you during panel discussion um, now um, I would like uh, to give floor to myself <laughs> and, <laughs> and I will <laughs> talk um, uh, I will I, I will talk about my motherland Europe and what going what, ha what has been happening over there as far as space recognition technologies and law enforcement is concerned and what lessons we can learn from them um, so next slide, please. So I will. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm currently leading one project in Europe on face recognition technology using law enforcement possible challenges and solutions. And um, if you just can open all slide in full, and we have um, so it's funded by the Lithuanian government, but uh, it's supported by um, London School of Economics as well as well as George Tech in the United States. And we've ca been carrying uh, empirical research, so doing a lot of interviews with different stakeholders from government, uh, law enforcement, uh, uh, NGO sector, and academics. And some of the people in the audience have also been interviewed. And thank you very much for the input. And I think during this presentation, I also will kind of present some of the insights that we got from from those interviews. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, I will briefly look at uh, at what has been happening in Europe as far as you know, to which extent the law enforcement authorities have been using uh, those technologies, a few examples, and then what problems they encountered, and I'll look specifically into the UK case, uh, Bridges case, which showed actually what problems law enforcement can encounter when they don't have regulatory framework and governance framework set up properly before they start using it. And thirdly, I will look at several uh, governance frameworks that have been developed, proposed and made, you know, already implemented by some in, uh, by some institutions. So in particular, I look into UK Metropolitan Police Governance Framework that they recently developed and they're applying in their practice and the proposed uh, a, um, Interpol framework, uh, governance framework for law, uh, for face recognition technology law enforcement. Next slide, please. Um, so now, I've, so if we look at um, the extent to which uh, uh, for face recognition technology has been used in Europe, actually we find a bit of divergence. So if we look at UK, UK is the bravest country in that regard, and they've been using it from quite early on and quite extensively. They they they, they call it trials, but they were trialing on a real uh, watch list sometimes of hundreds of people on their watch list. They were implementing those uh, or like um, deploying those cameras in, in different places, like in large sports events, music concerts and CCTV cameras and trying to identify uh, mainly suspects or, or possible victims of crime um, uh, in those crowds of people. Now, and uh, there, there has been some criticism against their use, but and we'll, I'll talk about one of the leading cases in the field that found actually that um, that they used was without sufficient legal basis and violating some laws. However, UK police uh, keeps using it and uh, they developing framings around it, um, but they don't abandon the idea of using live face recognition in public state, uh, uh, space overall. Now in Germany, the situation was different. So they also tried some technology, uh, some face recognition, live face recognition technology for the princess and train stations, but they encountered immediately um, uh, a lot of uh, problems technical problems because they ended up with a lot of um, uh, false positives and false negatives that technology was not really good and also a lot of criticism and when there was first a proposal to legislate around the use of these technologies and adopt the bill enabling them to use those technologies uh, across uh, Germany 
there was so much criticism that they had to withdraw the bill. And last year in Germany, the co coalition at the parliament was formed that advocates a, you know, for the entire ban of the use mm -hmm. of live face recognition technology space in public spaces both in Germany and across Europe. So they are much more against the use and they're much more careful and cautious and uh, 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 of this technology. And Netherlands, as a third example, I think it's somewhere in the middle. And so they've been also trialing uh, a few different technologies, such as catch technology, uh, which which actually, um, with relation to which they created a huge database of uh, uh, 1.3 million of individuals and actually much more photos in that database which they're using uh, kind of a, as part of face recognition and also the trial clear view AI. Now they and they also were kind of criticized and uh, some uh, there were certain prints collection and use of certain images was recognized as illegal, um, but they kind of keep using it and keep what they keep doing, developing legal and trying to adopt a uh, governance frameworks. Uh, so we'll uh, so I'll talk uh, about the initiative together with Interpol to, to develop a framework which they're currently testing as, as far as these are concerned. Next slide, please. So um, so now, uh, as mentioned, all these trials have uh, been uh, have been uh, kind of um, struggling with a lot of challenges. And uh, one of the examples of how these uses were challenged is this UK Bridges case. What happened there, so South Wales Police was trialing uh, the uh, uh, technology called uh, AFR Locate and they were deploying CCTV cameras on their police cars and po posting public spaces, uh, monitoring the crowd of people passing by and trying to identify people against the watch list that they have compiled. Watch list comprised of people, like it was like a couple of hundred people normally in the watch list, which were either suspects of crime or victims of crime and um, like hundreds of thousands of uh, facial images were collected from people passing by and a uh, few matches have been made as that and it resulted in a few uh, in a few arrests as well. Now, uh, Mr. Bridges, who was a civil activist supported by a community organization called Liberty, they brought an action against South Police, South Wales Police arguing that such use is illegal that doesn't have sufficient legal basis and breach, breaches data protection, privacy and non-discrimination laws. And um, initially they failed, but at, by, uh, at the Court of Appeal, they were successful in, uh, in, 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 in this case. Next slide, please. And so what was interesting, I think if we compare maybe to clear view case in Australia, where also police was found on breaching, uh, the, let's say, privacy laws when you, when it, uh, uh, trialing that technology, I think um, UK police had done much more work as far as legal framework was concerned before using that technology, but still the court found that it was not sufficient. So first they found that uh, there were not sufficient legal basis for the use, and so uh, UK police relied on the existing laws, such as surveillance laws, that data protection laws, and other general laws to kind of to, as a legal basis for their particular use, but the court said you need very specific regulations around face recognition technology how you're going to get an approval, how you're going to deploy it, you know, how you're addressing all the risks that are related to that technology specifically, and this was not in place. Now, um, now they are also you, the police have done the data protection impact assessment, something what, for instance, Australian police didn't do before trialing that clear view, but they found that this was done uh, defect defectively because, well, mainly because they assumed that there was sufficient legal ground for use and, and so they, they failed on that too. And the third interesting point is that they also breached equality laws or non-discrimination law. And as, as I think Nick and, and Hannah also pointed out, there's one of these problems, potential risks is bias in this technology. So while there was no evidence that this particular technology that they used was biased, um, the court found that the police did not take any um, steps to a certain where there was the technology was biased, right? So many to make inquiries about you know whether it's biased or not, and that was sufficient enough to establish that they violated discrimination, discrimination, non-discrimination laws. Next slide, please. So um, I suppose um, th this was one of the cases in Europe. There were more cases in Germany, for instance, where police was found breaching laws by using life face recognition technologies. And I suppose this uh, was a catalyst into this initiative to set up governance frameworks. And I'd like to mention two of them and kind of go into, de into detail what these frameworks set to give like some idea what 
sort of as like uh, elements governance uh, you know Australian police could could you know use when developing their own governance framework and so what is UK Metropolitan Police Governance Framework and another is Inter Interpol. Let's next slide, please. So UK Metropolitan Police, I suppose, we learned lessons from the case, from British cases. And I think two lessons, the main two lessons they learned. They need a legal basis, they need specific detailed regulations around how are they going to deploy when and you know they're going to deploy these technologies. And the second that they need to be transparent. This, I think this is uh, what has been highlighted uh, by both Hannah and uh, Nick and also in, in Nessus and Faust's presentation. And so this, so if you open now their website, you'll find this long list of policy documents that they've adopted very recently, just at the end of last year, um, that regulate now the use specifically of live face recognition technology for the, in public spaces for the purpose of identifying, um, like I think, purpose of prosecuting crime, something like that. So quite you know specific, not for all types of face recognition technologies. As as Nessa said, there are there might be like very different. You can use it in different ways, but they've taken that highest risk, you know, technology of highest risk, and regulated it in very specific. So many different um, documents and um, some policy documents, impact assessments, deployment records, and other documents. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'd like to look just at a few of them to kind of give a, you a, a, kind of an idea of what these documents contain. And I think they're really a good starting point to start discussing like um, government's framework. For instance, one of the first documents is a kind of a process a summary how um, how um, live face recognition technology is deployed. And it's a very user friendly kind of document with a lot of charts. This is just one of them. But like what police does from the beginning of kind of making a decision whether to employ and until the end when this, you know, after deployment finishes. And it gives a summary of entire kind of procedure. And I think this is exactly what uh, like public wants to know. Um, kind of some like uh, exactly why, how and, you know, this, in this technology side develops. And then in addition to that, they have a, uh, like a, an extent, a relatively lengthy 36 pages uh, policy document regulating each and every aspect of, um, you know, uh, of deployment of these technologies. So the, it mentions not only strategic objectives and use cases, it talks about under which conditions police can get the permission to deploy those technologies in particular situations, for what purposes and what's how the deployment process is organized. It establishes oversight bodies that is under the institutions who are responsible to monitor where the police complies with the entire uh, governance framework and they, it assesses the current regulatory framework and identifies a criteria which police has to comply with in each deployment scenario. So each deployment case has to be assessed against legal criteria and whether they meet all of them or not. Um, then there is a public engagement uh, section which talks about transparency to the public and like what information they have to make available to the public about the use. So it's certainly about overviews. So police he, he likes uh, um, kind of uses it all, always openly informs public to in, in, in the right measures indicated like how they should inform the public. For instance, each deployment action should be advertised on their social media first. So public knows um, uh, kind of that, that it's happening and other measures. Now there are uh, rules of how, how watches are being compiled, like which photos can be on this uh, on the watches, which cannot be, how long they can be, when they should be removed. For instance, if the person was found not guilty, should, uh, can the pictures still be um, uh, on the uh, on the watch list and so on. So this is a very detailed framework. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one last kind of document that I just wanted to briefly look at is I think very interesting for, for, for public uh, as far as transparency concerns is deployment records. So you can find on their website the exact list of deployment users. So when it was, uh, when the, these cameras were deployed, uh, how long, in which place, what was the watch list size, how many people were on the list, how these lists were complied, how many were total uh, alerts generated, uh, how many of them were false, true, and to which extent police acted upon them, how many, uh, in, in to, how many arrests, for instance, um, you know, it resulted in. So this allows public also to imagine, like, um, and also it's interesting how many people have been also, uh, how many faces have been seen? So how many thousands of faces have been scanned in order to maybe, you know, identify those two people and maybe arrest one of them. And this allows us to kind of to wait how much, you know, uh, interference with our priorities, how well it's balanced with actual 
um, kind of um, outcomes, positive outcomes of this. Next slide, please. And um, so this is the this this was the um, an example of what UK Metropolitan Police has done. I think another, another interesting example is this uh, Interpol World Economic Forum and also Dutch police work to develop those guidelines that all police all around the world could uh, apply in in in. Uh, uh, deploying those facial uh, live face recognition technologies in public space again this particular type of use and they they've kind of developed a number of principles and i think we've maybe those familiar with the area we're kind of a bit of tired of principles because so many sets of principles ethical principles for ai but i think they did a good job in, <coughs> in specifically elaborating what exactly you know how police should com could comply with these principles the next slide please so um so I think um, here a, a few, some of them. So I think they very clearly, these principles very clearly show that police, for instance, um, should uh, uh, should not use those cameras for general surveillance. What normally kind of people think that you know, they, when police start using face recognition, they will just follow me everywhere on the streets and can track my behavior everywhere. Which exactly it's which is precisely prohibited, and the police should use it only for specific criminal uh, investigation. There should be oversight bodies that exactly su supervise, you know, whether um, whether uh, police complies with all the guidelines, and in, and within effective enforcement powers, individuals should have a right to complain uh, of lodge a formal complaint when the technology is used against them. Uh, the, uh, the technology use should be only when it's necessary and proportionate. So essentially, police is not even allowed to use it for any crimes, only for serious investigations. What is serious investigation? It's supposed to be defined under the national law. So, um, but I imagine you know, like it's not for bike theft matters. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> something more serious. Well, my husband would be very happy with that because he got two bikes stolen recently. <laughs> <laughs> I lost the bike once too. Uh, so, um, but uh, apparently there are too much risks involved and too much interference with privacy, which cannot be, you know, can be kind of justified only when we deal with their kind of serious crimes. Um, also, it, uh, the user should be limited geographically, should be limited in time and um, and when, uh, and in addition, I think what's interesting, when, let's say, in, in, in the technology identifies a particular person, um, they, they should not rely fully on their outcome. The, there should be a blind second peer review by a second police officer who double checks, you know, without seeing the technology kind of result and double checks whether they really think that's a match before acting upon it. So uh, uh, this, I think, uh, human in the loop principle should be kept uh, with relation to this technology. Next slide, please. And that's my last slide. Uh, so maybe one more thing that. Um, next slide. Uh, and so one, maybe just one other principle that I would discuss, and I'm just selecting some of them. There is much more than that, but transparency is another very important principle that uh, this framework uh, highlights again, and it's it actually very specifically indicates what police has to make. Uh, they, what sort of information has to make available to the public. And so it's about starting from the vendor from whom they bought the technology, for what particular purposes they're using it, for instance, you know, to, to identify persons of interest or criminals, um, and then how they collected uh, and how they collected all the pictures, how they chose which pictures can be used in watch list, and um, how they store uh, how they store it, how to with which organizations they can share data that they collect, uh, all the information about uh, oversight and accountability. Uh, also, I think important another two important things, especially that under other principles, police is required to evaluate those technologies. They should have an independent evaluation, and not not only by vendor, but independent evaluation about effectiveness. And they should also have done their own testing and also provide uh, you know make an evaluation. And they have to provide all the evaluation methods and outcomes make it available to public, as well as uh, a record of complaints by individuals and also responses to their complaints. So see in such a, the, the, this governance framework, right, like there are a lot of detail of like what a good governance framework uh, could look like. And I think that's a great source of, you know, where you could start a discussion about like what sort of framework we could have in Australia. And the very last slide um, to conclude. So um, in conclusion, we see that the use of face remission technologies, especially live ones, in Europe has been challenged and in response to that 
what the police did is started really in developing and implementing um, governance frameworks. And the, if we, if I try to point to the most important elements of those frameworks, maybe which we could discuss, you know, uh, the second part of the session is it, it's respect to human rights, just privacy, privacy and non-discrimination. There's a need of this uh, that it's uh, employed only when it's necessary and proportional, that is very limited cases and not like, you know, wide range of locations. There should be oversight and a possibility for private formal complaints and transparency to the public. Um, the last slide, I think it's just a thank you, but thank you very much. And um, I'll just take a look with the time <laughs> before taking over my role as a chairperson. Okay, so I think we um, so I think we don't really have much time now for questions. We're a bit behind the schedule. So what we'll do, we will then maybe leave the questions for the second part, where there will be panel discussion, which is meant exactly to allow questions from audience, both in person and online. I'll move now to to coffee to a coffee break. Invite everyone here in the audience for the coffee break and a little chat before we reconvene in um, ten minutes' time, I believe, isn't it? Uh, meanwhile, our online uh, participants will be allowed to use a chat function to pose their questions to the panel, which we hope to will, which will be address as much as possible during the next session. Thank you very much and see you in some 10 minutes time. Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Thank you for sticking with us and those online as well. <laughs> Um, so, we're now moving to our panel discussion component of today's session. Um, and I would like to introduce Elizabeth Tidd, our, our New South Wales Information Commissioner, as well as Angus Murray, who is joining us online, um, who is with the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties. Um, these two amazing panellists have not spoken so far. Um, but we are also joined on the panel by Carla, Nick and Nessa, who you've already heard from. So a brief introduction of Ms. Tidd um, is the New South Wales Information Commissioner, CEO of the Information and Privacy Commission and Open Data Advocate. Um, Ms. Tidd has extensive regulatory and governance experience at an executive and board level, a Bachelor and a Master's of Law from UTS Sydney uh, and postgraduate certificate in executive management and governance. Uh, she has occupied a number of significant statutory roles, including Deputy President of the New South Wales Workers' Compensation Commission and Deputy Chairperson of the former Consumer Trade and Tenancy Tribunal. And we're really delighted to have you here, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Uh, and Angus Murray uh, is a partner at Irish Bentley Lawyers and holds a published master's from, in law from Stockholm University. Uh, and is an adjunct lecturer at the University of Southern Queensland. He is also the co-founder and director of the Legal Forecast, a member of the QLS Innovation Committee and IP and Technology Committee, and a vice president of the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties, which is his uh, current capacity today, as well as a director of the Australasian Cyber Security Law Institute. So thank you very much also, Angus, for joining us. Very happy to have you on board as well. Um, so I am going to shift this up of the way. The objective of this panel session is to kind of engage in some more dialogue and discussion generally. So I'm going to start with some directed questions and then we'll move to audience questions and some of the questions that were posed online. So I think throughout our first session, we really saw the importance of stakeholder engagement and transparency. Um, and in the law enforcement context, the public are really key stakeholders impacted by law enforcement practices, including those around AI and facial recognition. Uh, so this question is directed towards you, Elizabeth. Um, considering this reality, how much information do you think the public should be provided about the use of facial recognition technology? And also, um, what do you think about the current legal framework, such as the Freedom of Information Act, is this sufficient to enable the type of public access that we might need to these types of technologies and their use by police? I know that's a big question. Um, <laughs> please let me know if you can't hear me um, down the back. I might start with the latter part of the question in relation to the state of the current law. So Australia works under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, New South Wales is called the GIPA Act, Government Information Public Access Act. So now we've got the acronyms out of the way. Um, 
I think I'd like to start with an example of how access to information may well be impaired um, from a citizen perspective by use of digital technologies. Uh, there's a case that has recently been decided, probably within the last two to three months, from the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And it was brought by Redfern Legal Centre and the respondent was the Commissioner for Police. In that matter, uh, Redfern Legal sought data that came from a couple of different data sources. And it um, was couched in all the terms or the scope of the request. Well, was for a period of time, the number of strip searches that then led to charges for drug related offences. And so therefore, through evidence, it was actually described um, how police maintain different data sets for different types of information bringing together some of that information to be responsive to that access application required running an SQL code. And it had been done, it had been done about three years earlier and access had been provided. Similar, uh, only a different time frame, exactly the same parameters, but a different time frame. The tribunal heard evidence from New South Wales Police that um, it was a substantial and unreasonable diversion of resources, which of course is something that an agency can rely upon because agencies need to be in the business of providing services, etc. And not all of their resources can be applied to responding to a GIPPER application. Um, so given the way the data was maintained by New South Wales Police, police were able to demonstrate, largely by way of affidavit evidence, that it was a substantial and unreasonable diversion of resources to bring this information together. However, um, putting that aside and recognising that government agencies now will run SQLs all the time, we, um, how, is, how, are our, how are our emails stored? They're stored in noughts and ones. They all need some kind of treatment to bring them to life as government information. But the, the restrictions um, under the GIPPER Act um, that were relied upon in the tribunal's decision were twofold, largely, in summary. One, it was not information held by the agency at the time of the request. So the GIPPER Act envisages information being held um, and not bringing together different sources of information. Two, the GIPPER Act has a provision that actually expressly states that an agency is not required to create a new record. So putting those two provisions together, the um, statutory interpretation um, approach preferred by the tribunal was that it wasn't information, had to be treated, um, and they were sort of side issues to the primary issue of substantial and unreasonable diversion of resources. If you take that case, the outcome of that case, and apply it in a digital world, it almost implies that citizens will have a much lower ability to access information because it's stored in digital form. And isn't that really anathema to the concept both of digital government, more expeditious, more efficient services, more access to information, and also anathema to the right to access information? So that doesn't deal with facial recognition technology, but I think it gives you an insight into the current interpretation and the tension that now applies to um, our, our rights and the right to access information derives from the UN Declaration on Human Rights, freedom of information associated with knowledge acquisition or information acquisition, and how the, those statutes need to try and keep pace with digital government. Fantastic, Elizabeth, and I think that really uh, triggers also for me this idea that governance can fill some gaps yes. where regulation yes. falls short, but not all gaps. And we're seeing an example where the law really does need to be updated to allow for these other aspects that a private governance or a police governance framework might not be sufficient to deal with. Um, so the conversation needs to include regulation as part of governance, not just think of it as, as soft law. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. wonderful. Um, and I wonder, Angus, also, if you have something to add on this, maybe more around the facial recognition technology side and what you would consider might be the right amount or how much information the public should hope to be able to get about the use of facial recognition technology by police. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. Hopefully you're also able to hear me. Uh, 
I think in approaching this question, the way it's framed might lead to an answer that is incorrect, in my view, respectfully. It's not a question about how much information people can gain from the police. It should be a question about how much information is provided uh, without the need to prompt uh, by law enforcement or other communities about the operation of technology. And I say that in a variety of limbs. The first is, uh, as a standing proposition, technology isn't good, bad or neutral. Technology is as it is when it's observed. A difficulty that exists in this space is a disparity of knowledge between those using technology and those subjected to technology. And there's been a lot of interesting guidance from the European courts, Rita very eloquently summarised Bridges, which is effectively this question, uh, which dealt with a, a gentleman who on one occasion wasn't aware that he was being monitored by facial recognition technology on the second occasion had some signage that such a system was in place. And that was held to be incompatible with the right to privacy or Article 8 of the European Human Rights Charter as a consequence in part of the notification provided to an individual. So I think in answering this question, it has to start not with what people can get from police or law enforcement more generally, but what people are provided uh, and the baseline of trust that's established by police saying, we're using this technology, here's how it's used, here's where it's stored, here's what the consequence of it might be, and here are your rights expressed clearly in terms of review options or powers that you have as an individual in the connection of the use of this technology. I would also um, say that issues exist in this space that are much more complicated than I think even the complex question you've asked uh, superficially lead to, because in this space, one then has to descend into questions about how systems are operating and how transparent the directions or specifications of the operation of a system are, because that becomes inherently important in a review process. Uh, and I say that not to uh, align with a, a position that is facial recognition technology is bad because it's inaccurate, because I think that that sentiment is erroneous because it's getting better and it will only get better. So to say something is wrong because it's not good is to say it's good once it is better. Uh, and I don't think that's the approach. I, th I think the approach needs to be how do we as a society want to interact with each other and what tools should those enforcing law have against those interacting in society? And transparency is a key point to that. Part of the, the bargain of trust that exists here as well is implicit consent that people have as being part of a, a collective to the collection of certain aspects of information. And consent's a very difficult concept. It's the subject of some discussion in relation to the Federal Privacy Act review because being informed uh, for the purpose of providing informed consent, which is usually the requirement, is very difficult because it requires a person to understand how, what and when things are happening and be able to be dynamic in that approach to agreeing to certain actions. And I think, um, Hannah, it might have been you that said this, you've hit the nail on the head. Looking at this from a governance perspective, which is effectively the consequence that's flowed from uh, the decision in Bridges where they lacked internal governance uh, relating to the use of facial recognition technology, and looking at a more holistic approach uh, as regards what law reform is required uh, in a regulatory, legislative and governance sense to make this something where human beings, which is ultimately what we're talking about, are operating in an environment where everyone has an understanding and everyone has an agreement consensually for the operation of certain technologies. And I could go on about this quite a bit, but I think that um, I'm having the advantage or disadvantage potentially of looming over you as big brother in this. So I'll, I'll cede the microphone back to you. Thank you so much, Angus. And actually a very concise summary and I appreciate that. And I think it, you touch on a lot of interesting things, the different dynamics involved in transparency being a very important component of that and the directionality of transparency and engagement. When I was talking in my presentation about stakeholders being involved, that's multi-directional, right? And so a really good point about uh, what are our kind of preferences about which direction information should flow and how that impacts outcomes in terms of um, e efficacy. Um, I wonder if any of our other panelists wanted to chime in here on this question before we move on, maybe Nick or Carla or Nessa online. Does anybody else have anything to add in this, in this space? Comprehensive. <laughs> Comprehensive, we like that. Okay, wonderful. So, then I think my next question will be more directed towards Nick and also to Nessa, so getting the kind of Australian and um, New Zealand perspective on this. So um, how do you think we can ensure that facial recognition technology that is acquired or developed by uh, law enforcement actors 
is of a high enough quality and also fit for purpose. So what do we think might be some of the criteria for this quality assurance framework and what type of level of oversight, and I know Rita mentioned some of the different oversight frameworks that have been set up in the UK and Europe, um, what type of oversight and stakeholder engagement should we expect or desire in the development of this um, framework? Um, thanks, Hannah. I'll say a few things to that. Firstly, um, separating out facial recognition technology and specifically in AI more generally, of course, police can develop in-house um, capability to do to develop packages. For instance, the Queensland example that I talked about, um, where they developed this um, statistical uh, analysis tool, where they could then um, have a focused deterrence trial of recidivist offenders, um, works quite so well because because they built it from the ground up and they didn't acquire packages with data that they didn't know where it was from, and they were then able to have that transparent view of what the um, algorithms were doing and what the decision points were. Um, and so without sort of saying they want to cut out the private sector, um, that is one way that they can ensure that there's quality. Now, of course, you could point out that perhaps the in-house expertise might be of a low quality. It isn't, at least in that case, but that's, of course, risk, which then leads to the use of independent review boards, for instance, um, like they have in New Zealand wars, which has been talked about today in the session. Um, and that's important to have a wide range of stakeholders, both those who understand the technology as well as those involved in its governance. Um, and that leads on to the stakeholder component, and um, obviously vital to have information commissioners involved in that process, for instance, um, because often when policing go to, uh, let's say, an inquiry or a coronial inquest, those sorts of things, they're often asked as a first point, um, can you explain your decision? Why did you act in this particular way? What was it that led you to make the arrest and so on? And fair criticism can really be made on the decision points. And if you're not then able to understand again what the algorithms were, it's a black box we don't know, um, then you're in trouble. And therefore, things like an independent review board to assess the quality of that coming through, to assess the fact that there isn't any kind of black box is vital. Um, now, I, as I understand it, um, when it comes to the principles in play in Australia, for instance, I think the Department of Sciences and Industry have, have one that no one really knows about, apparently, that has been developed. Um, perhaps there is a question then about the stakeholders that were involved in the development of that and how widely distributed that knowledge is. And so crucially, I think, cross-jurisdictionally in Australia, you need to have uh, both the federal government and the states working together because of course we have cross-jurisdictional policing here, police jurisdictions will cross borders, we use technology like that, um, but also the law of course differs um, across jurisdictions. So I think having that cross-jurisdictional focus is important so you don't have one jurisdiction going off and acquiring tech and another one doing it in a very different way. So I think that perspective also needs to be maintained. Mm, fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and I wonder if maybe Carla or Anissa, you could expand on this from the New Zealand experience a little bit as well. Yeah, certainly I can do that um, and I endorse um, what, what Nick has said and I think um, what I'll do is just maybe talk a little bit about stakeholders, I suppose, wider than those professionals in the law enforcement um, context and um, Andrew and I, when we were doing our review, spent quite a bit of uh, time thinking about, um, uh, you know, a key theme in New Zealand as in other jurisdictions is the idea of um, policing by consent um, and the Commissioner of Police has expressed in New Zealand has expressed his intent um, that there will be policing by con consent and legitimacy um, and for us and our recommendations we spent quite a lot of time thinking about that about number one um, you know many of the people we interviewed across New Zealand police talked about social license and there being social license for some activities and not for others so we spent a good bit of time thinking about social license in this context and how indeed you would measure it. Um, obviously, there's a larger conversation around um, the concept of social license, which can be quite problematic and how it ebbs and flows over time. But we examined a lot of models of um, consultation and partnership. Um, so um, as uh, many people have said already um, in New Zealand, uh, there's an, an expert panel. Um, I know we've got one of the members in the audience tonight. Um, we've also looked at other mechanisms um, such as the Ada Lovelace Institute in the United Kingdom who set up a citizens biometric 
Council. So aiming to sample a wide range of people and see what their views were. And um, so uh, across the New Zealand Police, and maybe Carla could jump in if I'm getting anything wrong, but um, the Commissioner of Police does have a number of fora um, for various community groups. Um, so we talked about that being a possible, but it's clear that it's extremely hard to gauge, um, you know, what the community's view is on things. And if that idea of social license um, or that idea of community buy-in is to be used as a justification, um, for the implementation of a technology as part of a framework. Um, I think you need to see that really quality um, measure and consultation of that. And so, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, you know, a key requirement in the constitutional context of Aotearoa in New Zealand is partnership with Māori. Um, and so we mentioned that in our report as being, again, a key legitimacy um, tool. So, yeah, so, um, you know, just building on what Nick said about stakeholder consultation, I would add in, you know, the wider community context as well. And Carla, anything to add? Oh, I think you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I support what Nessa has said. I mean, it's certainly from our our perspective, police, we, um, we have to be sure uh, about what we're doing and we have to be sure about the public acceptability. And it is quite difficult to be able to, to measure that sometimes, but what you have found is that we have to open up those um, portals or you know, ability to, to consult. We do have a number of, of groups to enable us to do that um, from directly from our organisation, but also how we've also reached out um, to our expert panel um, to help guide us as well. Um, and we have a really good relationship with our um, Office of the Privacy Commissioner, uh, which is critical as well to um, be able to start uh, talking about what we uh, are thinking about doing and getting the right advice back. Thank you. And I think this is fascinating too to start to unpack who are the relevant stakeholders and how many there are. So we think not just about the community that's being policed and the policing organisation, but also Privacy Commission, Information Commission, uh, expert panels and the way that these actors can engage with each other. And as you point out, Carla, also throughout the process. So in development, as you mentioned, and perhaps bringing that development internally to avoid some of the complexities of um, commercial engagement, uh, but also then throughout the process and audit or response um, in review and just keeping that dialogue ongoing and making sure also that uh, perhaps minority or marginalised groups or groups that might be uh, more significantly impacted by the technology are also actively consulted. And I think this idea of active engagement is also very important in the same way that Agus was pointing out that we want the information to be available rather than having to seek it out. I think finding that balance sounds like it's going to be a really important component of ensuring that the facial recognition technology, but technology more generally that is used in a policing context is uh, equitable and fit for purpose. So thank you all for your um, really insightful thoughts on that. I will now move on to the final kind of structured question that I had before we open to the floor and to the online participants. Um, and this one might be more towards Carla or Angus to respond to. So this question is about what uses of facial recognition technology in law enforcement do you think are reasonable and justified? And do you think that certain technologies should perhaps be entirely prohibited or very strictly limited? And I think a key part of this question is if we do think that there should be some kind of restriction or limitation, what type of criteria should we be using to assess whether a facial recognition technology is acceptable for use in the community? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, what matters most um, in making those decisions is particularly in terms of the ethical decision making and public acceptability is how it's going to be used and whether the benefits of that particular use outweigh or are proportionate to the harms. Uh, and there needs to be an understanding of mechanism to get to that informed decision. So as from the research that Andrew and Nessa have done, we've identified there's a, there's a spectrum of use and at the large scale where we are now with New Zealand Police, uh, essentially using facial recognition 
for ver verification purposes. And on the other outside extreme is that, that live automated facial recognition. Now, before we would even go there, um, a big component of that is going to be around the public acceptability. Um, we also need to understand um, the accuracy of that and applicable to the data of our, our people here in, in New Zealand. Um, but also around, um, and you know, as you say, uh, we certainly wouldn't be looking at it at a lower, a lower crime harm, like a theft instance, um, for example, it would have to be something, a very serious harm that's imminent to threat to safety of life um, that we would perhaps consider that that would be a proper use of that technology in that circumstance. But until, you know, we are able to sufficiently well, you know, understand um, the technology, what the data that has fed it and trained the model, the algorithm modeling, um, we have public um, acceptability um, that perhaps appropriately regulated um, so that we don't undermine the public trust and confidence, um, especially where any negative impacts uh, may be perceived to outweigh those public benefits. Yeah, I think if I can jump in on this as well, um, I agree, Carl, that's a, a, an excellent way of framing, I think, the internal um, obligations or responsibilities. But I think it's also important to look at this at a slightly wider lens uh, and I pick up the word oversight because I think that that's a key uh, aspect to building trust, which I'll come back to in a moment. One of the distinct differences between uh, this jurisdiction, uh, and I'm talking Australia, against what exists uh, for our continental uh, and United Kingdom European colleagues is the existence of robust human rights frameworks. There's a common theme that runs through each of the decisions uh, that have recently been determined by the, the Grand Chamber of the European Human Rights Court, uh, which include bridges, but also relatively uh, at the same time was Gungram in the UK, which dealt with a gentleman who had uh, pictures, photographs um, in the course of his offending as a drink driver, as well as his fingerprints uh, and other biometrics taken and retained indefinitely. And there was an issue internally of what policies sat around the retention of that uh, biometric information, particularly his photograph, after the time it was needed, uh, being the entry of his guilty plea. Uh, the saving point that oversight was able to attach onto was the existence of a robust human rights framework. This country lacks that. So I would say a more holistic approach to this in the sense of not just the internal, which I agree is critically important to having a system that functions, but also the external oversight and review mechanisms that are underpinned by a rights framework that are accessible to um, people subjected to or involved with the operation of these systems and tools. To that end, I'd also say, uh, and I believe it might have been uh, Nick that raised the uh, Compass situation, the decision of Wisconsin and Loomis, which was a 2016 um, US decision, and an interesting appeal on whether using a computer program to determine the likelihood of reoffending. Uh, offended a person's right to due process uh, as a constitutional issue, and it was determined that it was not uh, because it wasn't binding on a judge. An interesting aspect that came out of um, Obiter in that decision is that the underlying specification and the reasons by which decisions were made were not made available to the court because they were proprietary trade secrets and owned as uh, information that wasn't accessible to the court process. Uh, when we talk about transparency and oversight, Transparency and oversight requires clear and unhindered access into the way in which decisions are being made or technologies are being deployed. And in terms of the exercise of trust, uh, which I, I think underscores uh, the point that I'm making here, I think it may be an error to rely on social license to enable uh, technologies like this to be deployed. The way, at least in my school of thought, our law exists is social norms that create fabric upon which we build the tapestry of our legal systems. Uh, to say that social license gives an ability to develop something that then becomes entrenched and then we start governing and regulating that, I think puts the proverbial cart before the horse in that the norm that people often accept is I have a, an iPhone, so I stick my face up to it, it unlocks it. So what's the difference between anyone else doing this? It's not an explored or well understood at a community level uh, concept or the consequences of that concept at least are not well understood or appreciated. So I think when we talk about oversight and transparency, 
we're actually talking about a much bigger issue. And I think, again, looking to the, the wisdom of those in Europe that have been grappling with these kind of issues uh, at a, a broader scale than this country for a longer period of time, uh, the importance of their underpinning human rights framework needs to be recognised. And I don't say that to diminish the role of uh, Elizabeth. Um, her office and, and offices across this country have recently made a number of decisions. There was a 2013 decision uh, in the state that you're sitting in uh, that dealt with CCTV cameras and the obligations uh, that are required to be compliant with the information um, principles uh, that New South Wales has under its uh, equivalent Privacy Act. There's also been recent federal decisions uh, detailing or dealing with accessing Clearview AI and issues that Clearview AI have, uh, as well as facial recognition used in 7-Eleven stores with the Information Commissioner finding issues there. But I don't think that oversight and I don't think that the rigour in the way in which the technology is being tested or uh, dealt with in any governance sense um, works well without the underpinning legal scrutiny and without the underpinning basis upon which um, judicial oversight can be engaged. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to actually elaborate upon Alice's point um, again with reference to a current case. But this notion that um, when the government engages with the private sector that it's sophisticated enough in its um, transaction to ensure that the issues of commercial inconfidence, um, intellectual property are properly addressed to then go on for, and fulfil their own responsibilities for transparency um, is probably an ill-founded one. And there are um, a number of cases, uh, one I'll, I'll refer to O'Brien, and in that matter, Ms O'Brien was a social housing tenant. She wanted to understand how her rental subsidy was calculated. So too did the social housing landlord um, who was engaged um, by what was then FACS, um, now Communities and Justice, Communities and Justice wanted to understand the workings of the algorithm as well because they had actually purchased the algorithm for, from a software provider. The matter went to, um, to hearing and ultimately it predated the GIPRAT, so predating the statute that imports information access rights to contracts for service delivery by government. So it predated, so section 121 wasn't applicable, but even so, looking at the notion of the con contractual provisions that actually excluded um, access to things like test suites, to um, the data that was used, to any audit um, trails that might show how the algorithm actually worked and who accessed it, um, to continually monitor the algorithm's um, use. All of those were excluded under the contract. And, and government is, is really only just coming to grips with how it maintains its obligations to citizens in these outsourced arrangements. It, it's a very vexed question. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's fascinating. I also think, I mean, uh, from a corporate law perspective, it's another opportunity for engagement in this AI and policing space as well. I mean, as you pointed out, <coughs> there is this kind of tendency to want to turn inwards to avoid the risks of outsourcing and consultation. But I also think there's a unique opportunity here to look at how law and regulation could be directed towards the corporate actors who stand to gain a lot financially and also that stand to provide a lot in terms of innovation if we can get this relationship right. And it may be things like regulating what can be excluded in contracts for services or regulating what must be provided in contracts for services so that there is a kind of a operating norm that facilitates better transparency and better oversight, which I think we're seeing as key. Uh, yeah, just a quick point um, on part of the question being is there some kind of technology that you sort of rule out, you know, that one's going too far. Just a few thoughts on that one. Um, and I think Angus was saying it before, you know, there's a difference between those technologies which are not so good at the moment but may be good in the future. But then there's presumably some technologies that are in principle ones that you might want to rule out uh, without getting into two fantastical examples, you know, Robocop, Terminator, that sort of thing. <laughs> One might think things like affect recognition technology, which works kind of like modern day phrenology, looking at, you know, face shapes and looking at, you know, the way your mouth moves and that's indicative of criminal intent. <laughs> like those are presumably some things that one might be quite worried about. And um, look, I don't know a, a ton about the, how far you can take those, but one might wonder then that in principle those are things that 
might, might not work for policing use. Um, so I just wanted to uh, explore that. And I think that's also why it's important not only to look at what technology we currently have access to and how we should be regulating and governing that, but also having a future-facing element to our enforcement also, um, even when it seems quite far-fetched initially. Because um, as Elizabeth and I were talking about in the break, this area is moving extremely rapidly. And we've seen with some of the examples that our panelists have given that the law lags. But also I think an important point that Angus is making is sometimes social perception or social understanding of impact also lags. We can be quite inclusive of new technology and innovation when it provides immediate benefit, but we don't always see the risk until uh, we've been exposed to that technology for, for a longer period of time. Um, so yeah, really good points on that as well. I mean, and there's a we could go into sci-fi when you start talking about that. But I think what's important for me about that point is going back to kind of fundamental understandings. You know, okay, what is it about those concepts that is particularly problematic? And I think that's where this kind of human rights framework that I just brought up as well might be helpful in providing some guidance. Um, and also international law, which hasn't been mentioned in this discussion, is another component of the work that some of us are doing at Macquarie, uh, around how those international norms might help to inform a more kind of streamlined, cross-jurisdictional approach to governance, which Nick's also mentioned before. Um, so any last thoughts on those first questions from the panel before I open it up to the floor? Okie dokie. Uh, so I guess then we will start with general questions from our audience here in the room and then move to any online questions from our online participants. Yeah. Thanks so much, brilliant. Um, just uh, on the human rights issue and the basis for how we'd, we'd, um, <clears throat> we'd evaluate what, what to set for. Um, one thing that might be considered is the uh, common law rights and, uh, and something that I, I haven't heard much discussion about generally, not um, is uh, concepts like innocent until proven guilty, um, and how that that is actually a very difficult concept to apply here because essentially we're monitoring everybody as though they're a potential criminal. And I haven't seen that wrestled with um, in general anywhere, and I just think it's an interesting question. Um, the other one about not being detained without um, without clear cause is another one. Well handled, but I just wanted to, to outline that as a potential basis as well. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I don't know who would like Sorry, to start. Let's jump that very quickly. Yeah, go for it. Uh, excitingly, uh, sitting in Queensland as a vice president of the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties and being heavily involved in campaigning for Queensland to have uh, a Human Rights Act, which was introduced two years ago. Uh, there are human rights frameworks that exist in this country. Uh, the big difference between human rights frameworks here and human rights frameworks elsewhere is the rights uh, as they're expressed in connection to remedies. So Queensland's a slightly stronger version of uh, the Victorian Charter, but in Queensland, it's still effectively a complaints mechanism that may, uh, and I look forward to, to testing this, include injunctive relief um, and piggyback relief in relation to damages of some aspects, which um, discussing the operation of the Queensland Human Rights Act is probably a, a session in and of itself, uh, which I'd gladly be a part of. In terms of the common law bases, uh, Australia is an interesting jurisdiction when it comes to this space, and the space we're talking about particularly, um, I will say, is privacy. There are other human rights engaged in relation to the use of this technology, like the right to association or political opinion in some contexts where uh, this may be deployed against protesters or, or people who have uh, political reasons for doing things uh, in groups. But focusing in on privacy, uh, the High Court made fairly clear in Lena Game Meets and the ABC uh, that we don't have a tort for serious invasion of privacy in this country. Uh, we don't have a constitutional protection of privacy in this country. And there has been a large number of Law Reform Commission and Productivity Commission recommendations to introduce such a tort into Australia. As it stands, uh, and to my knowledge, Queensland is the only jurisdiction that's come close to a tort for invasion of privacy. And the way that we've generally focused on this is uh, a breach of confidence where there's an emotional distress component uh, considered and found in relation to damage. So breach of confidence where uh, there's emotional distress caused and then damages flow. In Queensland, uh, the district court took that a little bit further and it almost makes a, a tort for invasion of privacy uh, in this state. 
in South Australia, the courts have specifically rejected that concept on the basis that that wasn't what the High Court made open uh, in the uh, Lena Gamex decision. I think each of those options are available, uh, and I think it's a good observation and a good pickup. So thank you for the, the comment. Um, I think the, the point that really needs to be mustered here is where technology is neither good nor bad, in fact, it's neutral, it, it is nothing until it's observed. The way that it's observed in the sense of it's the transparency around how technology is used and the remedies that sit partially as a deterrent for inappropriate use, uh, but also as a way of investigating how technology is being used and where better practices can be put in place. And I say Bridges and the Chief Constable of Wales is a shining example, uh, as is the um, similar decision of Gungren uh, that dealt with um, retained photographs. Absent of frameworks that are able to attach uh, judicial scrutiny, I don't think best practices can be established. And I think it would be a far stretch to say, um, and I say this with the greatest respect to the UK policing community, that those guidelines would be as rigorous or as detailed as they now are as a consequence of the process that Bridges caused, uh, which I, I think is the important aspects of uh, judicial oversight and the ability to attach clear rights and remedies to aspects of the use of facial recognition technology. Um, Carla or someone from Inter Police, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this kind of idea around common law rights and remedies as well and, and their relationship to this. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I can make a brief comment. I mean, I, I'm European, as my accent suggests, and, and this is something that I've been grappling with quite a bit for years all across my research. Um, you know, whether it is better for protections to have um, that more uh, stringent human rights framework like we would have in Ireland and across the European Union or um, like Australia and um, these, well, like some of Australia and New Zealand does not have a, a written human rights framework. Um, so I think I remain um, quite conflicted on that. Like I think in New Zealand, um, I, I'm not sure, can you compare those directly and say, you know, that European countries or others that have um, a, a human rights framework where you can take a judicial review on the basis of your rights, um, leave their citizens with any more protection than others. Um, but I think certainly in New Zealand, we do lack um, a way for citizens to, bring um, breaches of their uh, rights and their interests um, to some kind of forum. But um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question for further discussion and further reflection. But, um, you know, having lived in both worlds, I'm, I'm not sure I can say that that that's the answer to the, que to the question either. I mean, that's, I think, the sign of a good question if it's open-ended and, and stimulates mm. discussion. Oh. And yeah, I think I would agree with that. Uh, is there other questions from the floor? Yeah. Uh, I have a concern around the fragility of governance frameworks in the face of moral panics, disinformation or misinformation campaigns, where stakeholders may seek to strategically act to weaken protections, uh, whether by uh, you know, taking advantage of a criminal incident or putting out a you know, fake news uh, situation. And is that something that your analyses of governance frameworks is taking into account, the way that they could be manipulated? Yeah, and I think that this is where we see really interesting parallels with governance in the private sector as well, and this idea of governance as filling gaps in regulation, but generally being agreed as being insufficient, uh, if not viewed in correlation with hard law regulatory frameworks and oversight which we've been talking about quite a lot and i think it's been mentioned in a few different times this problem with or this problematic idea of social license right um, and we see this in the corporate space also and i think it's what you're pointing out one of the uh, primary flaws of relying on social license as a kind of guiding point for what is acceptable or not in the space of um, technology and, and law enforcement is that social license can be manipulated, right? Um, and so I think that's an excellent point. I think that the kind of uh, standard response to that is making sure that your stakeholder engagement is sufficiently robust and ongoing at different points in the governance process so that you design in resistance to that type of manipulation. Um, and how you do that, we've had a few different examples, right? So. 
um, kind of having these oversight bodies, having expert groups, having transparency that is multi-directional, so not just consultation where we bring stakeholders into a room and we tell them what we're going to do, but consultation that has feedback loops in place and allows for critical voices to kind of engage and respond. Um, I don't know if someone else wants to kind of build off of that or, or give an alternative perspective on dealing with this, this really important issue. I might jump in very quickly and I've probably had a flavour to some of the things I've said, uh, which is informed by a very clear bias. Uh, I have a, a passion and a background in human rights advocacy and that's the, the place I take this. Technology being neither good nor bad, uh, but technology where it's observed is the, the place to make the judgment call actually lends itself as an answer to the, the question. Some of these technologies have the ability to assist in discerning information and assist in decision making that aren't uh, pervasive in the sense that they don't have a direct application to a, a human's life. They can be used to um, cleanse or assist in understanding how or why certain information uh, has come into existence. So I, I wouldn't um, adopt in the words of one of the speakers today, throw the baby out with the bathwater and suggest that the answer is stopping this technology. I think that the answer is fully grappling with the way that the technology can be deployed and exemplifying the aspects that are positive and very clearly quarantining those positive aspects away from the negative aspects. Uh, and I think the example of dissemination of fake news uh, is something where there is the ability to use these kind of uh, natural language processing or machine vision tools to be able to assist in determining something that has accurate or correct provenance against something that has been created uh, for an ulterior purpose. That's a fan, fantastic kind of development on, on the concept as well as we can think about kind of the way that misinformation might impact uh, decision making or willingness to engage with a particular technology, but technology itself can facilitate that misinformation and how do we then engage with regulation of that dynamic. So it becomes very multifaceted. I think that's an interesting insight too. Thank you. Um, other questions? Can, from can I just make a, a brief comment on that as well? Um, I think this was quite a theme in our research as well, that a lot of people referred to kind of sentinel events like the, the Christchurch terror attack, um, you know, as as those type of events that might justify technology. But um, we were really interested in finding out um, whether there was actually an evidence base um, around the world for live automated facial recognition technology in particular. Um, you know, preventing events or all that, but there there really is no literature on it. And I think we can come back to that idea. And um, the other use case that is put forward quite a lot is, um, a, you know, combating child abuse uh, image technology. And I think there is some literature around that, but you will find that uh, marketing materials from facial recognition vendors will be heavily based around those two use cases. So I think it's really important to interrogate that. And that was one of our findings that supported the recommendation to pause any consideration of the live automated because there really wasn't a literature or an evidence base to support that at this time. Uh, so we've got three questions and I think we're going to go from back forward relatively and hand raising. Um, so go ahead at the back. Yeah, you. you. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for all the information and uh, the guests already touched the um, law and the te technology. Uh, what about the uh, cyber security? Uh, can we handle it and what is the forecast? Okay, fantastic. So for anyone who couldn't hear, the question is around the, the role that the issue of cybersecurity has in this broader discussion of AI and facial recognition technology and law enforcement. Um, does anyone want to grapple with that to start with? I'll give a crack. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, firstly, just picking up on something that Nessa said before with regards to how things are marketed at particular police use. Um, the Clearview case is a great example of that because it was used to detect potential um, child abusers, um, I believe, in certain police jurisdictions. So these technologies are already there having that application there. And in terms of the cyber security um, element, you, you have obviously your far off cases like 
will quantum computing allow us to break encryption and therefore ought we to be as policing looking into what happens when you know that that occurs potentially um, but secondly I think um, you have uh, potentially a, a place where policing that has yet to catch up with um, the threats both cyber facilitated and cyber native ones um, and that's where there has been some partnerships and potentially is uh, even more of a need for partnerships because police lack often the in-house capability to deal with it and then there are questions of jurisdiction of course that come into it which is these these actors are often you know external to Australia and New Zealand um, so yeah I'd, I'd say there's um, on the cyber security side of it um, in policing at least there is it's a it's a concern and a challenge and both from the workforce perspective but also from the technology perspective as to how police might be falling behind mm. Fantastic. Thanks for that insight, Nick. Uh, if, and very quickly jump in on that as well in the context of uh, the 2016 um, Coalition of Australian Governments agreement to implement the National Biometric Facial Recognition capability, ominously the, the capability in the submissions that I was involved in um, framed around that proposal and the, the way that that was um, proposed in legislation that lapsed and then reintroduced. Cybersecurity was a, a fairly significant aspect of that. And the reason why it's a significant as aspect of that and something that does really need a lot of proper consideration is when you're exchanging information about individuals and in the case of the capability it would be exchanging biometric information obtained from um, driver's license and other uh, data exchanging that information between the states uh, with the federal government uh, through an interoperability hub begged a lot of questions about how the interoperability hub would operate and why that wouldn't simply constitute a honeypot uh, or a, a pool of data that could have all sorts of unintended consequences. And there are examples overseas. I think Turkey was a, a prime example where uh, information uh, was obtained uh, by um, unscrupulous operators, if you will, uh, and that causes harm to each of the individuals that have the potential then that they will be affected by identity theft. And identity theft is something that I don't think has really grabbed the forefront of the conversation uh, here or, or generally in society because the, the consequences and the prevalence aren't really a mainstream discussion and the consequences can be quite dramatic. Uh, acquiring uh, someone's identity and then acting as if you are that person could cause all sorts of horrific consequences to a person, particularly if the use of the identity is to access unlawful material like child exploitation material which could significantly and substantially damage not only the reputation of the person but the very identity of the person and their dignity in the way that they operate and that is a really big concern uh, with this space I don't think that there's an answer to that but I do think that the answer to that is uh, probably along the same lines as what I had said previously about it isn't good enough now so we shouldn't do it isn't really a good reason to argue against this technology because the cybersecurity processes and the way that governments deal with uh, information is improving and will have to improve. And a part of the trust that exists between citizens and the state is the ability to deal with information without disclosing it to unintended third parties. So I think it's a really good question. It, it is a, an elephant in the room in the discussion that I suspect will have quite a bit of further work over the next couple of years. Yeah, fantastic, Angus. And I think it also touches on what we've come back to a few times in this conversation, which is the data that is generated from the use of things like facial recognition technology, how that data is then used for other purposes or protected from use by nefarious actors is, is a really important consideration. So thank you for that. Now we did have some other questions in the room, but those could maybe be held for our after dinner discussion because I also would like to give the opportunity for some of our online participants to ask their questions. So Frida, do you have some to share? Yes, so we had a number of questions online. I tried to group them in several groups and I hope we have time for at least like two questions. So uh, one question, um, if I group several of them, is about public trust. I, th I think that a few people asked about that. So, uh, on, from, on one hand, what legal rules would you recommend to increase public trust? Is it open algorithms, limits on storage, access to personal information, application of privacy law, and so on? And I think the related question is like, what happens when, you know, when when police some, does something and trust this um, challenge, and how what do we do to rehabilitate that trust? And I think we saw that problem in the UK and the, the 
the, 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 the person asking talks about indigenous communities, but I think also in Australia, as far as Clearview case is concerned, I think there were some now issues with trust because police was using technology without really, I suppose, social license and, and relevant rules. So how do we rehabilitate that trust when it's lost to some extent? Um, I wonder if on the legal world side, maybe I'm, I'm having to um, offer just the sort of starting point because I, I don't think, well, I do think trust is a dynamic concept and it's the trusting trustfulness um, process that um, particularly governments need to engage in, in that compact with citizens. But under the Keeper Act, um, having got the algorithm out of the way, there is a provision that actually says that um, policies need to be available. And there's a specific focus on a type of policy, and that is policies that affect individuals. And it's also policies that go to how administrative systems, how legal rules, how decisions are made about citizens. Now, in my view, and I'm now supported by the New South Wales Ombudsman, that means that if you are using an algorithm, you need to tell the public that you are. From there, there needs to be a couple of other components, and um, I think the Digital um, Republic law in France is one that is probably more cutting edge than we're seeing in Australia, and that is one, tell people if you're using an algorithm, you make a notice, the proactive release aspect that um, Angus was focusing on earlier. Two, make a general statement about how that algorithm works, sufficient for the for the individual person to understand. And three, ensure that an individual affected by that algorithm is able to acquire information about the workings of that algorithm. So I think these are the sorts of new developments in the law that um, let the citizens know how decisions are being made about them or that are actually affect them and what systems are used to inform those decisions. Fantastic, thank you. Um, does anyone want to build on that and maybe that element around how we rebuild trust as, as Elizabeth noted, it, it's a kind of evolutionary process. So if trust is lost, what can we maybe do as a response to that? I think the simple age old adage that trust is something that's hard earned and easily lost uh, has application here. And I think it's an exercise of demonstrating an ability to operate in a way that is uh, offering information rather than requiring a request of information about how systems operate and informing the reasons why these technologies are beneficial to society absent of rhetoric with clear understandings in the, the same way uh, that Elizabeth has just said about when these uh, technologies are used and the benefit for society. I don't think that's an easy road and I, I don't think uh, there is uh, an immediate answer to the question. But I, I think it's one of those things, again, with an adage, the actions will speak louder than words in this space. And that's why this idea of proactive governance is quite valuable here, right? Um, engage before the trust is lost. Engage and make sure that engagement informs your decision making, because once you've lost it, it is going to be harder to regain. And the bar might be set at a different place than it would have been otherwise. Yeah, just in support of that, the, the adage that I've heard is trust drives on foot and leaves on horseback. <laughs> and support of what you're saying, Angus. But also, um, what we do know from the research in the trust space is that one of the key dimensions of trust is intentions. So, whether or what you believe someone or an institution's intention to be worth engaging. And that very much speaks to the proactivity, then, because if you're just being dragged to the table kicking and screaming, most people are going to assume your intention is to avoid you know, liability or you know, you're doing it because you have to, not because you want to. And so, that building that intention is really hard to do. Um, over time, and yeah, being proactive is pr probably the one of the only ways you can really do it that I can think of. Mm, fantastic, thank you. Okay, one more question. I think it relates then to another question that I kind of compiled from uh, from from the online discussion. Uh, like we were talking about, like intention of police and to be transparent. And I think the, uh, the, this question relates more like about police and self engagement into the discussion. Um, about you know to which extent um, police has been discussing. Or all these issues and risks surrounding face recognition technologies, and to which extent um, there they, they has been or should be um, kind of um, critical engagement with the algorithm. So to avoid the circumstances where humans de defer automatically to what the algorithm has concluded. 
I suppose this is the question to maybe police representatives here and uh, whether you think that, you know, police has been sufficiently engaged and sufficiently understand the risks and, uh, and uh, you know, able to manage, manage them based on that knowledge. Maybe Carla and uh, could like, would like to start. Yeah, no, I'll uh, talk up on that. I think, um, you know, we've certainly learned and as demonstrated back in, you know, 2020, uh, we weren't sufficiently um, seeking the right information uh, to make those informed decisions. And it has been through that learning that we have developed um, where we are in our maturity now around how we assess um, the appropriate use of technology. But, you know, it's also interesting in regards to looking from a, a law enforcement perspective and operationalising our work um, because we have an obligation um, to keep our community safe <clears throat> and deliver the service that um, our people expect and deserve. And certainly from our experience, um, the public certainly think that we are already doing something. I think we've been uh, probably a lot more um, held back uh, in using some forms of technology um, and that um, there's a thinking that we're doing a lot more than we actually are which then rolls into actually then what are we then or how well or not are we sharing with the public um, about we, how we use um, the technology and what we're doing with it. And that's something that we've been doing over the past year is making that available online so that there is a list of technology that police are using and how it's used. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to also position ourselves to ensure that we have a responsibility for the data that um, that we use and collect and that we use it in the appropriate way. Um, and that, you know, I think from the, from the public, um, that expectation, if we can demonstrate that we have gone about this, the thinking that we've thought about all those implications, those risks, those harms, um, and if we make the decision at the end of the day to use a particular technology, we've done that thoughtfully and that it is, you know, we've done the right thinking. We can justify the use um, to be able to keep people safe. I mean, that's what we're here to do. And I think it kind of feeds into a little bit of what Angus was saying is there's inherently the risk in this how we use the technology. Um, so being aware of what those risks and harms can be, being able to then identify and put in the right controls and monitoring is really important. Understanding what the model was built on um, with AI, especially if it's uh, not one that we've built ourselves. We need to have those key mechanisms in place to ensure that that model or that machine is still you know, fit for purpose. It is still delivering the expected result of what we intended it to be um, when we first engaged with it. Thank you, Carla. And I think that's a really nice point to close on because it kind of summarizes the the, um, the lessons that you've learned in this space that hopefully we can continue to learn from as we all evolve and, and engage with this technology. So um, I want to thank all of our uh, panelists and all of our participants as well for their amazing questions and pass back to Kate because a big thank you to as well for hosting. Well, thank you very much for everyone for coming along. I think it's been a, a great discussion and um, I've certainly learned a lot of um, listening to that. So that um, I'd like to uh, thank all our panellists for um, coming along and um, if you've got time, please uh, stay around for some drinks and, and some finger food and um, have a chance to talk in more detail with Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.